So, hi. Um, I was worried because this is like the graveyard shift that people, the energy might flag, but I've had the pleasure of talking with the panellists for the last while and I know this is going to be a really exciting and thought-provoking panel. So the topic is open access and Lorna asked us the question, what, um, across all of research outputs, what services, what policies, what infrastructures do we need to make this a reality? What are the challenges? What, what do we need to do? So across the panel, we have a great mix of, um, uh, well, you'll recognise our keynotes, I think. <laughs> um, but we've great um, mix of researcher, publisher, library perspective. And I think um, it's fair to say that open, open access is a complex uh, an ecosystem and uh, you can't solve it with just one piece, one part of the community. It's a wide community, so I'm glad we have all the voices here. So how it's going to work is um, everybody's going to take, they're going to introduce themselves and take five minute kind of opening statements and lay out some thought provoking ideas I think and uh, what's needed and then we'll have 25 minutes for Q&A and um, so please put your thinking hats on while everybody is talking and come with your big questions big questions small questions no wrong questions I mean there are none so um, we really want to hear what people think I know this is important for everybody in the room and uh, it's really something the sector is um, is uh, facing into right now so I'm going to get out of the way and uh, hand over to our first speaker. Okay, uh, good afternoon everybody. My name is uh, John Costello. If this thing works, oops, I've, I've already gone one ahead. So my name is John Costello from DCU. I'm a physicist and as I explained to everybody, that's probably the worst example you can get to represent the broad, uh, the broad science community. I was the Dean of Science and Health at one stage, so I did interact with other scientists for a short period of time, but I'm back there. So I'm a physicist and a researcher, as you can see, and I have published in open access journals purely open access journals that are gold only. And I'm on the editorial board of the Journal of Modern Optics, and it's a sort of hybrid journal, but it's not very successful on the open access side. The big question, I think, is the model, who pays? So these three people here, you've got a publisher, you've got a librarian, and you've got the poor old author, that's me. <laughs> and so we're all engaged in a Mexican standoff because we need each other. But actually, we're usually fighting with each other as to who actually pays, because the publisher is trying to develop revenue models in this new environment, which is very difficult because people don't want to pay for print subscriptions, so you move to the poor old author. So you, you're librarians, so you've got to look at your cost model, I guess. And who really pays is the funders. And so that's where the onus of payment seems to be shifting is towards the funders and scientists in general are not too happy about that because it's going to take money out of their pocket as they see it because it has to be paid for. Policy, look. Uh, the, the, the old adage about sausage making, you know, so, so, so basically it's, it's, it's unpleasant when you see it happening in practice, so you're better off just to consume it afterwards. One thing I would say is that um, if you look at the open access publishing policy, to somebody on the outside, it looks like it's been driven exclusively by, uh, by funders. It, it, they, they seem to be setting the agenda, and not just H2020, but they all kind of lead each other and, 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 and follow each other around. The other thing I'd say about open data, there seems to be confusion out there. So, so people talk about open data, but actually what I want to talk about is kind of open scientific data. I think that that's the one where people mix it up and they get, they get the terms confused. So in terms of services, I think you might be asking yourself, what do the libraries of the future actually look like and the librarians? And you could in fact conceive of, if you, if you connect your published work with the data, and then you want to essentially access it and you want to reuse the data, other people want to reuse it, that's going to be a very, very different business. And you're going to have to make a distinction, I think, between the open data and what's the library's function in open data in the future. And if you look at value extraction, the best are probably the astronomers. They're constantly sharing data in open access repositories, theoretical and experimental data, and getting new value out of it as they apply it in different areas. In terms of infrastructure, I think it's going to be a huge problem. So the word of the afternoon is zettabyte. So a zettabyte is a billion trillion, okay? And a, a trillion is a million million, and a billion is a thousand million. So, th so the numbers are, are going to be crazy. So in terms of supporting this thing and going beyond more, I think that's going to be a huge problem. So in terms of infrastructure, we have to start thinking about the cloud. A third of all data is currently now in the cloud, and that's going to, go on to increase. So libraries in the cloud, Proper if you're going to do this, you have to have proper curated data repositories. 
We're a leading location for data centers. And the co-location, I mean the people. I don't mean necessarily the physical infrastructure, but if you have those people, how do you co-locate with them and collaborate with them? And there's a huge shortage of talented scientists. The last thing I'd say is the following. For us as scientists, it's all about prestige journals. And in fact, a, a colleague of mine said there's, there's an inverse relationship between the number of words in the title of the journal and the quality of the journal. So if it's nature, cell, blood, or science, you know it's good. And if it's the Journal of Physics B, Atomic, Molecular, and Optical Physics, you know it's probably not so good. If you, if you look, people are impacted by, there, there are top quality open access only journals out there, like New Journal of Physics and Nature Comms, but there's an awful lot of noise. I've got one minute, I'm just finished. And the other thing I'd say is, if you're really going to go down the route of connecting, as some publishers do now, the original experimental data, and I mean the raw data, not the process data, the raw data that other people can mine and process, and you put that together with the publication, you want to make that widely available, then that's a very different thing. You really need proper data platforms. And I, as I said, a definition, because when you talk to some people about open data, they don't talk about what scientists and researchers talk about, which is research data. They talk about general data that's available, published statistics from government and so on. And I think that confusion of terminology needs to be taken out. I'm finished. Thanks very much. Thanks, Jim. So, um, well, most of you probably know who I am, but I'm Danny Kingsley. So I head up the Office of Scholarly Communication at Cambridge University. Um, I'm going naked now because I'm going without slides um, for this session. So just to pick up something that you mentioned then about the data. Uh, at the UKSG meeting recently, Barend Mons, who's a researcher in the Netherlands, spoke, and he talked about the sort of the enormous amount of data that's being generated in research now, and how really it's too much for us to read, and we really need to use machine reading to actually analyse all of this work. And he was talking about supplementary material, and he was saying really in the future the data is the publication, and the supplementary material is the article. So it's a flipped world. And he, said, and he was talking in terms of the European Open Science Cloud and the plans for Horizon 2020 and saying that we need, we're going to need 500,000, count them, data curators in Europe in the next few years. So if you're looking for a career change, um, anyway, moving on. Um, so talking about open access, the way I see it, there are two kind of fire fronts um, in open access. One's down the green route and one's down the gold route. And down the green route, it's embargoes. Now, let me just state this once and for all. There is no evidence at all anywhere that green, uh, green uh, open access is causing publications and subscriptions to be cut. So publishers are arguing that the reason why we need embargoes is because if they did allow people to make their research open access immediately, this is the author's version of the work open access immediately, suddenly libraries are all rush and, and cancel all their subscriptions and therefore we need embargoes. Now, because of embargoes, that means that publishers who want immediate open access for their funded research have to go down the gold route. To me, that means the tail's wagging the dog, but that's what Wellcome Trust have said. The reason why they pay for gold open access is because if it were a green open access policy, it would not be immediately open access because of the embargoes. So because funders have now said, well, we want immediate gold open access and here's some money, and quite a lot of it in the UK, We've got this other option, which is hybrid, where you pay to make a particular article open access when the rest of the journal's under a subscription. To give you an idea, Cambridge spent two million pounds last year from Research Councils UK and one million pounds from the Charities Open Access Fund, which is primarily the Wellcome Trust, on open access. 85% of that is spent on hybrid. That's two and a half million pounds spent on hybrid open access. Now, we do have some offsetting deals with some of our publishers, so we do get some of that money back, but primarily that is double dipping. We're paying twice for the same content. This is very, very expensive. And there is a real lack of any actual evidence that this is causing the journals to flip to gold. This was the plan. The Finch report in 2012 said, oh, what we're going to do is we're going to make all the UK research open access and we're going to encourage the transition by <coughs> paying for hybrid because that will encourage um, publishers to flip. We have got the Springer Compact, where we pay a fee for both open access and subscription, and that is now we've done the analysis worked out for, effectively there's an article processing charge of about £360 per article, which is probably about how much it costs a publisher to pull it out of the workflow and stamp a Creative Commons licence on it and stick it back in again and shove it into PubMed Central. So it's about right. I don't have a problem with that. I think that's quite good. But otherwise, there is no evidence that this is moving. So. 
If we take away hybrid, what could we do with this 85%, this two and a half million from Cambridge alone? Think about that over five years across the whole of the UK. That's a lot of money. We could be building really strong infrastructure to support data management and all sorts of open access and different other types of publishing out outputs that actually reflect the kind of technology that we have available to us. So I feel that we really we need to kill embargoes, we need to kill hybrid. That's the thing that needs to happen and the funders need to actually say we will not pay for hybrid open access. We will only pay for open access in fully gold uh, journals, not hybrid ones. And the other thing I'd like to say in my last minute is um, that we're asking the wrong questions. So the funders are saying, particularly RCUK, UK, what is your compliance level with our, fund, with our policy? Now the policy itself is not about compliance. The goal of this is not that we have 85% or 100% compliance with the policy. One assumes that the policies are about sharing research and having that research being used out there in the, great, in the wider world for greater good, whatever you want to argue, better science, greater good, society benefits, there's lots of different arguments for it. But we're not actually measuring that. We're not measuring whether or not this has had an impact, whether this research is being used more, whether it has had a societal impact. And that's what we should be measuring. Because if that's not working, then we really actually need to start questioning the whole fundamental underpinning argument for open access. Hi, so I'm Robert Gallivan from Minute University, Professor of Strategy there, so not a librarian and not in that space. Um, but I've been involved in a couple of open access journals at quite a low level, so maybe a practitioner's view uh, as to what it's like sitting at the bottom of that. Uh, but because um, I'm, uh, I'm a strategist, you'd sort of expect a strategy slide, wouldn't you, with a model uh, coming up on it, so I won't, I won't disappoint. So I'm going to bring up uh, the one that you've all seen before, and sorry, I didn't realise these were bills, I thought they were a single uh, piece, but the good old Porter's uh, 5 courses, anyone who's ever done a, a business course has done. And, and the reason for that is that the publishing industry is an industry, and if you try and change an industry, you need to understand the forces that are causing it to be the way it is. Um, and as it stands, at the moment, that particular industry, um, and I'm going to jump on and bring up all of these bills, uh, and I realise that they, they do that. Um, as it stands at the moment, that industry uh, is effectively driven by the buyers, the libraries, who purchase off uh, the industry, who have competition to create better quality journals, who take in inputs from the suppliers, the academics, uh, who are producing that particular piece of work. And that manages uh, both the pricing through competition and it manages the quality uh, of the entire value chain as it delivers uh, out to the users out there on it. And, and largely what we've done is, as Tania said, you know, we've created a greener way to try and muck about a little bit with that, uh, to say that after some embargoes we could let some of that free uh, at the end of it. The gold OA moves the model in a completely different way and actually says that what we're going to do is we're going to manipulate the supply side uh, of, that, of that arrangement and we're going to start to pay the funders for it. Now as a strategist I've got a real problem with that uh, ever working, that if we actually move entirely to that particular space, uh, one is the publisher has been paid as soon as they've accepted the article into the system and so then have no incentive uh, to ensure that there's high quality and have no incentive to ensure that the back end works in terms of people being able to get uh, long term and high quality access to the stuff. The job is done as soon as they've got it in uh, and so I think you risk pushing the quality uh, of your inputs down and push the quality of the inputs down and the quality of the outputs start to start to go down fairly quickly uh, fairly quickly with that. So gold away in that way creates that problem. The other one is how do you actually agree uh, what a price is? Um, what do you agree the publishing cost is? And we we know from the research that's been done that it sits somewhere between 100 euro and 5,000 euro. And that's not really useful when you actually come to sit down and do a negotiation. Um, I, I had the pleasure uh, when I was in Cuba a few years ago of meeting a very nice gentleman who worked for the Ministry of Pricing. And his job was to decide the price of products in the country because there's no open market. And so somebody in an office sits down and do it. And we know how efficient Cuba is now at pricing their products on the not open market over there. And Gold OA, I think, actually risks uh, doing that. And the hybrid, you know, some, some version of both of those, uh, those evils uh, inside in it. So I'm not a huge fan of that, although I think it's an absolute necessity, probably for quite a while to come as we try and resolve the issues that sit inside the industry. The one that I'll advocate for 
for. And it's not to take over from the other two, because I don't think there's a single solution to it. Uh, it's the one that says, why don't we try and disrupt this industry a little bit? Disrupting the industry gives us some new models coming into it, and it also keeps everybody in the industry on warning that, look, if you don't play the game and improve, uh, we might actually eat you with some other models coming in, probably described as diamond open access in there. So let's innovate and disrupt and bring uh, new models um, into the system to make that happen. So the question then is, what would we need if we were going to put in place uh, some diamond open access inside of it? Um, so I think we need a shift in terms of thinking who the publishers are, that we need to go back maybe to some of the pieces where the institutions and the learned societies actually think of themselves as the publishers, that they are the people who want to bring the high quality material uh, that are generated in their institutions and in their communities, and they want to bring them to the marketplace. To allow them to do that, then we need really good digital publishing platforms. And that's really easily said, and you sort of assume that that would be easily delivered. Uh, but from my experience of mucking around with trying to get journals uh, up and running, um, you know, good, good, will, good willing computer scientists in, in, in universities come along and build a platform for you, and then they move on to something else and the platform dies and your data disappears. Uh, I'm involved in the Irish uh, Academy of Management's journal, and just before I came out I was looking at some of our repositories there, and I noticed that volume 34 has vanished somehow. Uh, now, somebody will have it on a database, but it's vanished off the internet at the moment, simply because there actually wasn't a solid publishing platform that we could rely on sustainably to work over time on that. And linked to that is an integrated digital repository that actually sits there at a national level and maybe even at a European level, with guaranteed sustainability that once people realise that they'll invest in that and put their material into it, that there's no chance that it's going to vanish like poor old volume 34 did in there on it. Um, there needs to be some sort of a market for back office publishing services to provide these uh, things to, to the universities in there, and some sort of an integrated front end so that we can access these pieces, because relying on Google Scholar, which has been driven uh, effectively for free by Google for the moment until they so decide not to, really isn't good enough. So a few simple things to do, but very hard to do in practice. Uh, I'm uh, Lorcan Dempsey, uh, responsible for membership and research at uh, OCLC. Uh, it's the third time some of you have seen me. Um, anybody who knows where volume 34 is? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think um, um, I, I um, from, a, from a general working and day-to-day um, point of view, I'm not, I'm not heavily involved in this area, so I'm, I'm not um, um, an advocate, which uh, many of the participants in uh, open access discussions uh, are an advocate for, for a particular uh, position or, uh, or a point of view, uh, more, more of a, an observer. The benefit of being an advocate is that you, you, you uh, have some certainty and you uh, have a, a strong point and um, um, can be quite sharp about things, uh, difficulty but being an observer is that things tend to be um, more blurry. Um, so uh, some, some observations. In our discussion uh, beforehand, John, this John said um, that, that in some ways the, you know, maybe the, the clarity or, or perspective of some of the early open access discussions had um, given way a little bit and that there was a little bit of um, uh, uncertainty and, and you know, wasn't exactly clear where you know, direction lay. And I think uh, we have a situation at the moment where uh, open access um, doesn't necessarily mean one thing in, in a particular discussion. We have um, uh, a broad uh, range of approaches. We have different national policy frameworks. We have different funder expectations, which creates actually quite a puzzling um, environment. When people use open access as a, as a phrase, uh, sometimes they will have different things in mind. We had an example in one of the sessions earlier where open access was being used, um, and really, when questioned, it was a, a version of uh, gold open access, um, you know, non-hybrid gold uh, open access. Um, some other people, when they talk about open access, probably are thinking about a, a, a green open access repos repository-based view, so sometimes it has to be qualified. Um, particular stakeholder groups um, uh, who have an interest in the whole ecosystem uh, are potentially divided about directions, whether they're researchers, universities, uh, publishers. 
At the same time, as we've heard over the last couple of days, publishers are diversifying products to support more of the research life cycle. A publisher is not just a publisher. A publisher supports research life cycle, see their job as making research more effective, getting various jobs um, done, and are also diversifying customers in the sense of um, it's not just libraries, it's the research office, it's other parts of the, uh, of the uh, institution. Um, many publishers, you know, see a world now where there is uh, going to be an open access future. The question for them is, uh, well, what is the uh, business model for that? And, and uh, you know, are committed perhaps to uh, to a gold uh, route of of some sort. Uh, libraries clearly have a strong interest here, but libraries don't tend to be organised for collective action and don't necessarily have a um, a single perspective. I uh, had an interesting discussion with a, a, a library director uh, recently of a large research institution in the US and I asked um, did he um, um, support APCs? Uh, no. Uh, did he strongly uh, lobby for open access on campus? No. And um, why not? Uh, well, because uh, uh, this particular university was concerned about uh, rankings, about um, climbing in, in those rankings about moving um, or advancing. Um, and uh, uh, because the reputational economy, if you like, is based on publication, is based on the journal literature, he didn't want to do anything that would interfere with that reputational um, economy. So that was, um, uh, he didn't want you know, his institution to feel that he was doing something that uh, interfered with that. Um, so um, uh, it seems to me the library has an, an interesting role now in terms of being a partner and advocate for the researchers in their institution and to advocate for the university and researcher interest in the scholarly ecosystem. But there may need to be some reflection on what, on what that interest is and there may be a variety of interests in a, a particular institution. So this is a multifaceted um, task. It does seem to me, from the point of view of an organization like Connell, one of the things that Connell does is scale understanding or scale learning you know, in, in venues like this. And it does seem to me that there is, uh, at the moment, um, a, an opportunity to revisit, if you like, what a position is in relation to this very complex uh, environment and to help shape uh, some understanding through that um, um, scaling and convening that an organization like Connell can do. Thanks, Lorcan. Thanks, Lorcan. Um, I was a librarian rather than I'm a librarian, John Fitzgerald from UCC. I'm Director of Information Services, which means I look after IT, library, and publishing. And what I'd like to do um, is to take you through um, very quickly some slides that I produced for the first meeting of the European University Associations new task group on open science, a group set up by the universities of Europe, their, their representative association, to look into open science. Uh, and I was, I discovered, the only librarian there. A lot of presidents, a lot of vice presidents, a lot of directors of research, and so on. So I felt the onus to fly the flag of the libraries. And I trotted out some of the predictable kinds of scenarios that you will all be familiar with, a lot of the uh, conundrums, a lot of the um, glaring anomalies um, and tried to get the minds of the people around the table um, to some extent away from the bigger issues uh, of open science. Um, this particular slide was produced a lot of um, uh, interest, particularly um, in, in the context of, of, of the fact that the three scholarly publishers hit the high uh, of the highest in terms of profit margins. And the outcome of this was a recognition that there is some merit in working with the open access movement to create infrastructure, to do the things that the open access movement is trying to do, and also there was recognition that we have a lot of um, power in our hands. So what I um, tried to do with them was to say that we are in the business of paying a lot of money um, and um, for, for the information that we acquire in very simple terms, and is open access really making uh, a, a, a difference? Um, or should we change our tactics and, for instance, look at how peer review and assessment should be performed? Should we upend the model and look at other elements? Um, to my surprise, um, the group uh, over the last two years has taken up 
the mantle, if you like, of trying to organize itself um, to do the big deals better. And it has set up a subgroup of which Cahill McCauley uh, here of Connell is a member to try and bring forces together and actual hard spend data to share contracts in a confidential uh, legal fashion and to see if we can actually uh, hammer out not just better deals but better relationships uh, with the publishers. What we've tried to do is essentially continue to promote uh, open access um, but to open negotiation Open, open negotiations and also to try and get a lot of political awareness. So the Dutch were very good during the Dutch presidency uh, of the EU in raising awareness of this particular issue and there was a very strong open access declaration but there was also extremely robust um, negotiating going on behind the scenes um, with the big names. I have a concern that we are beginning to produce more reports now about uh, open access than um, pushing open access forward. Just this morning, I got into my mailbox, in fact just this afternoon, um, Spark, their latest bulletin, some of you will see it, another report on open access policies in Europe. Um, this particular report, which is a very good one, um, one of the authors is Stephen Pinfield, who is also a member of the, uh, uh, the group, and uh, also another ex-librarian. Um, this particular um, uh, open air report, um, again, says a lot of predictable things. It sets the target. Um, it talks about the size of the market. Um, it looks at the open access market. Um, it makes a few quantitative, very familiar quantitative um, 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 conclusions. Uh, these all come from the foreword. And it says, finally, that open access requires strength and incentives to change authors' behaviours. It's highly fragmented in Europe um, and in the world. Uh, there's a slow growth. We need to up our game if we want to get where we want to get. And there is no silver bullet. It also says that there are six um, roadblocks to be removed. And none of these roadblocks are particularly dramatically, um, in my view, effective for moving things forward. What gave me most uh, interest in this particular group, in this particular report, was a page about external sources of disruption, such as SciHub, where you can download your pirated articles, or indeed the ASAs, the Academic Social Networks, 60 million users. Um, and this particular sentence, the risk of significant disruption to industry of the industry cannot be discounted, but as the rest of the study has shown, powerful cultural forces serve to maintain the status quo. Pretty depressing. So, I like the idea of significant disruption, I like the phrase. I think that we should think about significant responsible disruption on our part, and do so through going right back to the interface with the publishing organisations and do as the Germans, as the Dutch, as some of the others do, walk away from deals and ramp up our um, displeasure and our adversity to what they're doing. Last slide, I got this again in, the email, in my email this morning from a colleague in Melbourne, which is celebrating Melbourne Knowledge Week. It's really about public libraries, but it would be interesting if you inserted the word universities for libraries here. Universities have historically leveled the playing field, offering access, indeed creating, knowledge and technology for free, a virtue that goes some way towards dismantling socio-economic dis disadvantage. These principles make universities inherently democratic and increasingly important. My strong sense is that we have a moral obligation to make information more available and we are not only um, supporting a, a very lucrative business model, but we're also, I think, uh, not supporting um, the democratic wish of uh, universities and of people to access and share knowledge. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, John. So that was amazing. That's um, very broad views. I think everybody stayed time. I don't know how you managed to curtail yourself, but thanks very much. Um, so this is your conference, and this is the, um, the half an hour to come with your questions now. Um, I know I see Elizabeth with the microphone. Um, when someone has a question, just uh, arm straight up. Oh, first one, front row. Surprise! <laughs> um, Danny, I think it was yourself who said that there's no evidence that green open access is causing journal subscription cancellations, which I totally agree with, that the evidence does definitely back that up. But I suppose you could ask, are subscription cancellations 
uh, you know, not a good thing maybe for libraries, you know. Um, uh, it'd be better maybe if we didn't have to keep spending large portions of our money on these subscriptions. And, you know, if you do take that view, I suppose, um, does that mean that models like gold open access and I guess maybe more creative or disruptive models, things like di diamond open access or other, other new forms of publishing are the only route and that green w will never allow libraries to cancel journals, which is a problem still, I think, um, in itself. Danny, will you hold for one second? Because you were so brave with the first question, Monica has a prize. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we call a surprise prize. Um, yes, getting rid of subscriptions is potentially good for libraries, but what that's not what's being spoken about. What's being spoken about is the rationale for getting rid of subscriptions. And the rationale for getting rid of subscriptions is cost, not because that some researchers may put a copy of their work in some sporadic spread out repositories around the world. That's the argument the publishers are saying, that if we allow people to do this, it suddenly magically, I can tell you, I've got, I'm working in a, in a country that's got the harshest open access rules in the world, and we are still only getting 50% of the material through the door. So you, just because you let people do something doesn't mean they're going to do it for a start. And even if they do do it, it's not that it's in necessarily in a, a usable form. So you'd want to be sure of your ground as a library to say, okay, I'm cancelling that subscription because I'm pretty sure that this behaviour will continue and that we will be able to get hold of this material across the board somewhere. And things like unpay will help so to us to sort of aggregate this information. So it's maybe starting to get a bit closer. Um, so that's the argument about the green does not equal cancellations. So that, that's that part of it. But the second part is the where do we go from here? What, what does this look like into the future? If green is having an impact on subscriptions and if it's having an impact on the usage of materials, then we should be tracking this. We shouldn't just be putting a, a blank wall up saying, no, 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 nothing, no, 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 nothing to see here, which is what's going on. We should be tracking this and saying, well, what does this effect mean? And then what, 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 what do we want to do into the future? And we're not having that conversation because we're being stonewalled by saying, well, we'll just put a 12-month embargo on. I predicted it. When Finch came out, I said, OK, so what's going to happen is publishers are going to put up their embargo periods to force us to pay for gold. Elsevier and Emerald, uh, not Elsevier, sorry, Emerald and uh, Springer both did it but put up their embargo periods. It was inevitable. Of course you would. So, um, so the thing that isn't happening is the conversation, I think. John, could I um, uh, follow up on that? Like, I was struck by your um, the idea that libraries have a responsibility, uh, the responsible action. Um, do you, what do you think about cancelling subscriptions or taking, I suppose, a principled approach to it? What does that mean for libraries? Well, I think that it's it's a pretty pretty blunt um, action, but it is sometimes the only thing one can do if if you're talking about it um, as an action of choice. Um, but what I would like to kind of stress is um, that I think, again, we should look at the evaluation of research. There's a very good set of principles, I think, they call called the Leiden principles, if you look them up, um, of research evaluation. And they're kind of altmetricy as opposed to bibliometricy. Um, uh, but they look at, um, they take a much fresher look and view at how we should measure uh, research evaluation. Because unless and until we really put, if we put as much effort into that side of the, of the, of, of the ecosystem as we are into the making available into the, 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 the kind of, the, the, the disclosure and revelation element, I think that we would probably make a lot more progress. Um, so I would like to see the focus actually turning away from the micro issues and looking maybe at the micro issues in that particular neck of the woods. Yeah, that's good. We'll take another question from the floor. Kate. Um, question to picking up on what you said there, John, about. Uh, responsible um, renegotiation is one thing we just talked about uh, refusing and or taking you know just just refusal I guess I'm wondering at what scale would refusal need to take place to be effective um, I'm looking at the Dutch experience of that and the very high level at which that negotiation was taking place you know, would it be national? Would it be European? Does it well, need to be wider? Yeah, I think there's a very interesting standoff going on. I don't know what the, the latest update is in Germany, but where 
um, the German consort the new German consortium has walked away from Elsevier. Well, it did just before Christmas. Elsevier was switched off. Um, Science Direct was switched off. The, the, the bundle, as it were. Um, and then it came back on again in mid, in early February, um, without there being any change to the negotiating negotiating position. Uh, and the, the the word was that Elsevier were afraid that people would actually um, start going to the to, to, to the alternatives, going to the the hubs um, in search for their of, of their articles. So, I mean, the, 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 I suppose the belief in the EUA at, in our particular group is that we, uh, if we can act at European level. Um, you know that we will be addressing a total um, market worth one billion, um, and, and I suppose it has to happen at that, that at a scale like that. But very, very difficult in any consortium um, to to act, um, you know, as a consortium because you would inevitably have, you know. Um, countermanding um, um, instructions coming from the national jurisdictions, the national education agencies. So we haven't tried it yet, but it's very interesting to see. You know, Germany has a kind of a, a you know somewhere between 200 million and 150 million contract there. Uh, it'll be very interesting to see how that one pans out. Another question. We're keeping you busy, Elizabeth. <laughs> Over here, Philip. Thank you. Um, one of the early speakers said, are we asking the wrong questions? I think I'd, I'd change that to, are we asking the wrong people? And, and I was taken by John Fitzgerald's um, uh, discussion about, about we taking action. I think it's great, let's, let's have a call to action, I'm all for it. But I think we need to define who are the we. And I think John was talking about the we being the universities. The, the big picture universities. I don't think it's the university librarians who have the power. I think it's the academics in the universities who have the power. And it's only when those academics refuse to submit their papers to the likes of, well, we all know who, it's only when they refuse to do that that those publishers won't have the material that they can then sell back to us at those grossly inflated prices. We don't have the power, it's the academics who are the producers and they have the power. Philip, I think this is great. Uh, like, uh, I, in, in having, um, John has to speak for every researcher um, across yeah. the world. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I think th there is an important question about the impact of open access on career progression for the researchers. Yeah, so, so, so the main thing that academics chase is reward and recognition. Okay, that's what they're chasing all the time. So that's why they chase the prestigious journals and so on. And, and to some extent, th those publishers of the prestigious journals actually have huge power over academics because they chase those down. And the funding agencies, I can tell you, uh, your friend Mark Ferguson, he does not want us publishing in you know, very low impact journals. He wants us publishing in the highest impact journals he can find. So there's no real case for us not to submit to, to certain publishers to force them. I think the problem is that, as I said earlier, they're trying to, sh the business model, they're, they're, they're struggling with it because they're trying to shift it towards somebody else because the libraries rightly are saying we need value for money and our budgets are tight. Um, so, so what they're doing is they're looking towards the authors to get them to pay. Much of the problem is that there's so much noise out there. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of, of, of titles coming from publishers that are popping up a few every year. Uh, all with replicated journal titles and it's, ca it's causing confusion and that's why people are trying to go distinctive but I don't think that, I, I think you're right, I think it's the universities but it's at a very high level, I don't think it's the academics and, and the researchers um, but, uh, but I, 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 I do think it's all about the VFM, value for money and it's, 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 it's obviously, you know, there's a price point for everybody. I mean, I mean, we heard earlier about a market and the markets in Cuba. There is a price point. There's a market. I mean, if you, if you go to MDPI, this, this new publisher out in Switzerland, if you publish in Applied Sciences, it's 1,200 Swiss francs. But they have titles there for 100. So they clearly have a market. They're actually putting values to the titles. And the ones which are more popular, Supply and demand, they're the ones that they're going to charge more for. So, so I, 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 I think if it's a negotiation, I think John is right. I think it has to be at a much higher level. It goes to the senior management groups in the universities and then on up to their, whether it's the ECIU or whether it's the European Universities Association or, or whether it's that crowd that the Russell Group in the UK are in. I can't remember what that European high-level one is in Europe. And it's at that level that the pressure has to be applied. 
Laura, can um, Robert? Yeah, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, so I mean, I, I, I agree completely with that. Um, I mean, if you if you look at the system in terms of what drives uh, academics behind it, I mean, the universities have a system of ranking. Uh, sitting within that, a really important part of that is research output. Sitting then within an individual academic's career path is being able to count publications in ranked journals out there. So there's absolutely no incentive uh, for an academic who wants a career uh, to not try and publish in, in, in those journals. The only reason that an academic wouldn't publish in those journals is because somebody says you can't um, and change the actual system that sits, sits inside it. Uh, it goes so far as we had a conversation uh, with a few colleagues last year where we talked about if you were a lecturer starting your career again now and you could get into one of the really high journals by paying out of your own pocket €10,000 to have an article uh, published in it, would you do it? And the answer was absolutely you would do it because that will be repaid 10 times over. So uh, saying that the academics have the power, certainly they are the ones who make the final decision of where it goes, but the system drives them to make that decision. And if you want to change their decisions, you have to change their incentives. Great. Um, Danny, can I just, yeah. because Lorcan had used a phrase I hadn't heard before, um, which is that um, the researcher is outsourcing their reputation management to um, publishers. I was just thinking well, that was relevant here. I, I, I was quite struck by the Porter, you know, the five forces, the use of the five forces model. Um, if you think about, you know, on, the, on, the, on this side you had, was it um, gold? Uh, one of the reasons, I mean, gold is attractive to publishers because it, 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 th there's a sort of transition. You can transition the reputational economy, you can transition the prestige of journals, you can tran transition everything. What you're changing is the way in which it's paid for. So, so part of the attraction of gold is that it, it allows the model to, to make a transition. Now, clearly, a smooth transition would require a global flip. We're probably not going to have that, so we're, 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 we're in this... Uh, um, situation that you know Danny described. On the on the other side, um, you know where you where you had green, um, you um, green sort of depends on the existing publishing system. I mean, we, we have a lot of discussion about repositories, about networks of repositories, about um, um, incenting people to be in repositories, about actual mandates for for people to be in repositories, but the. The, what, what that does is make uh, particular papers uh, more, more readily available. It doesn't change the underlying pu pu publishing system or, or, or structure. Um, the diamond approach is disruptive, but then you get into a, an alternative set of uh, issues where you have to sustain the new publications and you potentially end up in the same situation because you, 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 know, you have some small publications and they get bigger, then they have to charge more. Then, you know, so it's, it's quite interesting. So it struck me looking at, at the model that uh, you know, it goes back to uh, Philip's question, are you, are you asking the, the right question? Um, so what, what people are trying to do is to disrupt the publishing model with, with, with activities that don't necessarily disrupt the publishing model because the publishing model is, um, supports reputation management. The, so the incentive of universities to participate, the incentive of researchers to participate is very strong because it is the way in which their reputation is assessed. It's, it's the way in which they're promoted, it's the way in which they are assessed for uh, uh, grants, it's the way in which uh, the reputation management with the, within the academy works. So I think John is, uh, John is right that, uh, you know, that that needs to change in some way because that is supporting currently a system and without changing that there's very little disincentive as our academic colleagues have suggested in withdrawing from, from that system. Um, I think it also complicates the I mean, the, the other approach, the uh, renegotiating or having fairer negotiation, that's, if you like, trying to recalibrate the current situation from an economic point of view. So all of the things that we're talking about sort of leave the system sort of as it is in some way, but maybe change around the way in which access and so on works. And unless you change that reputation management uh, piece of it, the whole system is, is very difficult to change because what people rely on the publication system for is the dissemination of research, all these things. But importantly, it's the way in which academics are assessed. It's the way in which um, um, they're evaluated. It's the way in which they build reputations. And uh, your, your reputation is what you're selling to the institution or you know, it's, 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 it's your currency in terms of moving. So I, I think um, um, what we have is the publishing ecosystem is the ecosystem in which reputations are made and measured. Yeah. And, and that is a, a big force for inertia. 
Yeah, let's tread lightly. Danny, you want to... I was just going to add to the, to the financial incentive. Um, I gave a talk on Friday night, um, which I've just tweeted out the slides to, which was looking at academic incentive and reward. Um, two points on that. One is that there was a study done of e economists um, and what they would be prepared. Would they be, be prepared to lose a limb to get published in a journal, and a very high-ranking journal? And the answer was yes, half a thumb is what they would be prepared to give to be published in this particular journal, which is really indicates something's very, very wrong. Um, in the same talk, uh, I was able to link out to a whole lot of incentives that are cash incentives that are paid in some countries specifically for publication in certain journals or journals with certain impact factors, um, and it's quite a lot of money. So this is very, very much underlining what's going on, and this is really, really hard to crack. And so we, what we've got is a conflation of the means by which we're trying to communicate research and the way that research is, is evaluated and or researchers are evaluated and rewarded. Um, and in fact, all the journal publication system does really is evaluate and reward researchers because it's a bloody terrible communication system. It's slow. Um, it's very restrictive in the manner that you can, you can write and uh, you are very limited. I always encounter problems because I link to things like blogs because that's where the discussion's going on and the, the, the referencing system in publications doesn't cope with things like websites and blogs, for, for example. Also, if you're working in an area which requires analysis of like genome or anything that's high data, a written text in a PDF form is completely useless to you. So this, this is not a good communication form. So in some ways, green, if we, if we actually broaden our thoughts about green and think about preprints, for example, and lots of new preprints archives, that's where the, com the conversation's going on. That's where the communication's happening. The, or, most, uh, if you talk to high-end physicists, in fact, I think I've got one sitting next to me, um, most of the publications going on in archive, you've got, you then publish something, you rewrite it and publish it into a journal because that's the only way you can get counted for reward. It's bloody ridiculous. It's a waste of everybody's time. I don't know, you may wish to comment. No, no, okay. it's, it's, it, it's true. Archive, I mean, it's, it's, it's the most important source for physicists is archive, and we've gone, we're going to see it long before it gets published, long before it appears. So we're reading stuff a couple of months, and, 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 and the other thing is indexation, which really annoys researchers. Indexation, you know, we're, we're, we're all driven by bibliometrics, whether we like it or not, it's part of that reputational stuff. But, but some publishers are so slow, it's really frustrating for researchers, particularly if somebody is, say, if somebody who's applying for a job somewhere and they want to update, so. Mm -hmm. But preprints, I, 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 I agree. I mean, would, would have to be an incentive to go green, and green would have to get the reputation that we currently have if we either go into print or, or if we go open access with the, with the established publishers. I, I was going to laugh when you said that a young researcher would give up a half a thumb um, and the £10,000, but I thought, my goodness, like really what that means about the pressure that young researchers are on uh, under, it, it's um, not, not, not as funny as it sounds. <laughs> Carl, you had a question. Hi, thanks very much, Sandra. Uh, it's on, is it? Okay. Just want to make a few, uh, I suppose, a, co a comment, but then a question for the panel. First of all, I just want to compliment whoever had the idea for this panel. It was a fantastic idea, and, and, and well done, whoever that was. Um, but first of all, just going back to the comments about the, you know, the career needs of academics and so on to publish in high-impact journals, I mean, it, it's quite depressing, really, that uh, very uh, bright people, at whatever decision level it is at, okay, don't understand, really, how unreliable the impact factor is as a measure mm -hmm. of anything and how uh, problematic would be the most polite word I could think of, that whole the calculation of impact factor is, and also, for example, the way that the publishers game those numbers in terms of requesting editors to cross-reference each other and all this sort of thing. And there's been some terrible stuff has come out recently mm -hmm. about that. So I'm not really sure what it is an indicator of, and I'd read, uh, say it's depressing if we continue to rely on that into the future. But my question is, um, uh, sorry, and it's the last thing I want to say about that is an analogy that I, I hope John Fitzgerald doesn't mind me saying he's used before, you know, just because you can eat in a five-star restaurant doesn't mean you're a gourmand. And uh, really, that's what most of what it's telling you is that you've got in somehow, be it through a gold open access fee or however you've got in there, it, what else does it say about you and your palate? It's, it's very unclear. Um, but my question really is the German model uh, that was referred earlier, one of the key things they're looking for in their new deal is to shift the balance from... Um, pain to be read to pain to be published, which is, of course, always what we wanted, but it's, 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 it's uh, drifted from that over the years. And to get the panel's view on what difference that kind of shift would make to uh, the ability to maybe, in the short term at least, strike better deals, and obviously in the long term maybe start to move towards a different model. 
who wants to grab that one? I mean, I think the, the, existing bundle, uh, the existing publishing model bundles together a range of things that were appropriate in a print distribution model. And uh, what we're seeing is the same thing that's happened in a, in a variety of other places, that stuff is being unbundled. But we're stuck with a model where you're paying for particular bundles. So what you're saying is you, you unbundle. And in some ways, this is what green open access is about. You, you unbundle the communication element, and that becomes free. So what you're, what you're doing is paying to be published or paying for the reputation management. So, um, uh, uh, and uh, APCs are sort of you know similar there. So I think I think you know we 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 are seeing a, a move in you know to paying for a, a different you know configuration. And I think some 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 thinking about that would be would be quite interesting. I did want to make a side comment about library publishing. You know it, you you've made some comments about. Uh, uh, you know, faculty or academic staff. I think as a community, the library community models very poorly what it talks about. You know, when you look at the literature that supports the library community in terms of the journals librarians publish in, the journals librarians are on the editorial boards of, um, the um, uh, open access to uh, the, the library literature. So, you know, when you talk about, you know, the if only researchers would behave in a certain way. When you look at the library community itself and the literature that supports it and think about how much of it is open access, how much of it is published in particular areas or wherever, it's, it's, it's really quite um, shocking in some ways, I think. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you look at a sort of pay-per-view model um, with, with current charges, so if you look at, for example, Nature, and if you want to download something, it's, it's whatever it is, $34, and it's like $9 or whatever, if you just want to do a kind of pay-per-view, so you have a limited time access to the article. Um, that could actually reduce your costs, because you're, po you're paying for a huge amount of content that never gets read. And so if you actually did some, some analytics and tried to figure out, well, what are people looking at? by looking at the downloads in your university, you might be able to figure out what, how much you're paying and how much it would cost you on a pay-per-view model for those publishers who do that pay-per-view. So there, there may be other ways, other ways to do this because what's really frustrating for a researcher, and it happens all the time, is there's a prestigious journal with, with a very, very high cost tag uh, tied to it. And the library, for obvious reasons, has to just say, well, we, look, we looked at this, it's getting a couple of hundred downloads and we have to get rid of it. But wouldn't it be much better if we just did pay-per-view? Because, you, you know, it's, it's a prestigious journal. Some people are using it, but it's not used a lot. And that would work out at a cheaper cost model. And then if you integrate it across the whole of Europe, as, as, as John is talking about, then you may actually be able to get a better balance between your costs and their, their revenue model. And then they'd have to adjust their, their costs accordingly in time. And we know what that kind of means, but that's what they'd have to do. Yeah, I, could, I think it, the... The drive has to be to simplify the payment system, um, uh, and um, certainly there's evidence not just of double dipping but treble dipping, where you get research funding agencies who will fund. There, there are examples of research funding agencies directly funding journals as well, um, and, and, and these have been documented. Um, but just to pick up on on, on, on Larkin's um, point about uh, librarian behavior, behavior or misbehavior, the, the perception certainly among uh, university presidents who have now become in the, in the European context, they have taken the reins of the negotiations away from the librarians because they are convinced that we just weren't robust enough, weren't strong enough. And there, there's, there's a sense of, well, how could you have let all of this happen for so long and not really done much about it? So not all of which I would agree, obviously, and subscribe to, but there is that strong perception that we are not being effective enough, not being strident enough, and not being active enough um, uh, in, in, in prosecuting, I suppose, the, 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 the justice of this situation in financial terms and in other ways. Thanks, John. Um, I have the five minutes, um, and we've one more question. I guess I, I'm just really struck by um, how complicated this is, and we are only talking about publications, really. And something that Danny said really has stuck in my head, which is, why are we doing this? So it seems as though we are... Um, spending more time thinking about compliance and business models and um, delivery mechanisms and forgetting the thing that 
John was talking about, which is that you actually want people to read the research, you want people to access that. That's what the point of open access was, and somehow has it got lost along mm. the way, or, or law, you can't see the wood for the trees, I suppose. Can I give the last question to Chris? Oh, oops, I didn't realise it was going to be the last one, but thank you. Uh, Chris Presser, DCU. Um, having spent the last 15 years or so trying to find workarounds to this movement of money, as John pointed out at the very start, between libraries, researchers and, and uh, publishers, it's probably worth pointing out that the publishers didn't invent this problem. The Academy invented the problem. Danny started her talk this morning in the 17th century with learned societies, and it's not really about publishing, it's about elitism. Mm -hmm. And it's, I guess my point would be, it's not that we're necessarily asking the wrong people or asking the uh, wrong question, but are we actually asking a near impossible question? which is around the only way that we'll be ever be able to have open access and equality is the removal of any sense of hierarchy in our, in our uh, sector. For, at a departmental level, at a university level, the removal of league tables and a true equality across universities. So without that, an awful lot of what has, in my experience, allowed for 15 years of conferences about open access uh, seems to use, I think, somebody's phrase this morning, uh, libraries in the cloud, but is it actually cloud cuckoo land? So, the, uh, Nirvana, um, everyone is equal, but some are more equal than others. Um, who wants to take that one up? I'll start with that one because I think it's a, I think it's a, it's a, it's a great insight into it. Um, and there's so much talk about the league tables and the rankings and the, the metrics around uh, the journals. But of course, the only people who actually don't care about that in doing the research are the researchers. Because they know who the top people are. They know where the best work is. They collaborate with them. They work with them on a daily basis. And that entire edifice that we've created that is about measurement is measurement for the sake of other people who actually don't know what's going on with the researchers. Um, and so we have, you know, and we do this in all our, you know, I mean, it's a, it, it is, it's a fundamental outcome of new public management, and you can go back and blame Maggie Thatcher for kicking that one off, but that we should be running public institutions in the way we run businesses, and that they must have outputs, and those outputs must be measured in a particular way. And what we have now is a system where the cost of measurement is ridiculous in comparison to the cost of actually doing the job. And there is a very fundamental issue that's, that's built into that. Yeah, so great point. I did. I did. I remember talking to a librarian who's married to a physicist, and she was talking about um, uh, her husband uh, having various uh, friends around uh, Saturday afternoon to watch uh, uh, football and compare their age indexes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> <Is it? laughs> Hope that wasn't which you, John. Is, which, uh, <laughs> which, which was rightly pointed out, is 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 a very flawed model, and it's not just gamed by uh, impact factors in journals, not just uh, gamed by journals. But uh, H indices are also gamed by, by individuals doing south citation and cross citation. And try, the, uh, try my friends, the astronomers, again. They, ne they never publish a paper with having less than about 60 references in it, even if they only need 10. OK, I'm going to wrap up. I've got the 60 seconds from the timekeeper. Um, I suppose um, something um, for us to think about, because as Lorcan said, what we have here probably is a big crowd of advocates, and what can any, all of us do? I'm struck that it, um, how difficult it is to change the publishing model, because it's very entrenched and it's across the whole system. But I think there are opportunities on the other research outputs, so that's the data, the software, the other artifacts of research being conducted now and that's in its infancy and maybe we need to put um, as much thought into that right now and in influencing the policy the services and the infrastructures for that so that in 10 years time we're not trying to fix it as it's become entrenched in a way that's not really serving the user or the research community. So, um, Carl said whoever put the panel together was a genius. I want to, um, I want to um, double that thought and, uh, and to say thanks to Lorna Dodd because um, really interesting conversation because of the people that were here. So, can we thank the speakers and wrap it up? Thank you.